we can get started. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see you here. Um, my name is uh, Sveta Stoicheva. I'm a data literacy librarian at DePaul uh, and um, excited to be joined by my colleague Shannon um, moderating this uh, session um, and, um, you know, kind of putting on the conference. Um, so this session um, is um, called Missing Hand, Missing Information, uh, using digital scholarship opportunities to expand, using digital scholarship to expand opportunities for media literacy instruction. Um, so uh, our presenter is Abby Mann, the online learning librarian at Illinois Wesleyan University. Um, and uh, the session is going to um, introduce us to a uh, student um, created website, uh, assignment that uh, allowed students to make themselves be aware of themselves as uh, consumers and producers of information um, and explore how um, digital platforms allow spaces for introduction. Um, I know that that missing hand, missing information title really uh, <laughs> had me wondering. I wonder what this means. So I'm really excited to find out. Um, yeah. And thank you. The titles um, may so be much. the best part. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Abby. Um, and, um, and to all of you who are here um, for joining the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Seta and Shannon, for co-moderating and all of you for coming back from lunch. Um, so yeah, um, what I want to do today is I am going to tell you about this missing hands, owner's pictures identity, um, and take you through that. And I may sort of geek out about that for a little while because it's kind of fascinating, but it does come, as Seta was saying, from a, a website project that some students at I, we were doing. Um, I want to use that one example to sort of talk about some of the pitfalls of students doing website uh, projects and how we can maybe shift those into potentials and then sort of shift to thinking about like pedagogy. I'm calling this sort of forward design, right? If backward design is like you start a project, you start by knowing what your ultimate objectives are and to design your assignments around that. This is where I think I kind of discovered through this that there may be some really interesting affordances of this project and that students were doing some rich and interesting thinking. Um, so thinking about how I could design for that in the future. And then I really do want to sort of end at the practical about sort of using digital spaces to foster these outcomes. So just very quickly, this was a website project on the Spanish Civil War with one of our um, Spanish professors, and she'd actually done this in the past as a um, analog project, right, where they actually collected stuff from the library and different pictures and images from books and then made a library exhibit, but we talked about shifting it to being digital. Um, and I did give the students this very rich and carefully researched um, set of archives that they could look for so they could find information. I don't think this was the best idea to do it when I did it. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I do want to show you that they had all these resources. None of you are going to be surprised to know that in their first iteration, and they actually erase this image once all this happened from the website, so I can't show you, but basically what they had was this picture and this picture and the caption Rosera Sanchez Mora, right? So I went through this as I did with a bunch of them and was first of all like, where's this image from and who is this actually? So I do want to let you know um, that Rosera Sanchez Mora, um, also known as La Dana Matera, did actually exist um, and she lost her hand in 1936, maybe making dynamite, maybe in a military action. That story also has a military, has a million versions floating around. Um, we Weird fact, I didn't know this when I gave it the title, but she actually didn't know where her amputated hand ended up until about 2014. Um, and I gave you the citation there. So my, my title was more, more uh, prescient than I realized. Um, but what's important to know about her, she actually became a symbol of resistance for the Republican army. And Miguel Hernandez, um, who was a Spanish Republican poet, wrote a poem about her that was fairly popular. I'm not gonna embarrass myself by reading it in Spanish, um, but just so you know that it is there. So she was a pretty important figure in terms of the Republican side of the Spanish Civil War and particularly um, how women were understood as being part of that. So that's her. Um, in terms of the picture itself, when I did a reverse image, uh, Google image search, right, um, and just I think initially I got, the students might not have even had her name, so I figured out her name, so I was able to do that, and you get this picture showing up, you get information about her, you don't get a lot of information about the image itself. Um, and then you see it start to pop up in some weird places. So for instance, here's a colorized version of it, which is kind of beautiful. Um, in the somewhat disturb disturbingly named Reddit um, military porn, that was not the most disturbing version of that I found. There were some weird uh, women in uniform fetish sites that it showed up on. Um, and it also showed up, for instance, like in this twi uh, Twitter tweet, <laughs> This tweet, uh, it was a Twitter stream, I guess, 
there you go. I'm cool with the, the hip logo. Um, that was for Women's History Month, right? And does give us all this information about Rosario Sanchez Doma, uh, Marta, but it does turn out that it's from the Russian state affiliated media, right? Um, which is kind of an interesting thing to find out. Um, and, you know, by the end, they're talking about how she died without ever giving up her beliefs. So she's a sign of sort of belief in socialism and the ways in which fascism has has corrupted that. Um, even when you find what are maybe more authoritative sources, uh, El Diario is a fairly well-known Spanish newspaper. Um, it is sort of given as like, this is fact. This is Rosario Sanchez Mora, the second from the right, right? There's no attribution of where this came from originally, but it's circulating as this authoritative picture. Um, and so it's not actually till page five of your Google search, reverse image search, that you find this article that asks, what do we know about this photograph um, of five, five armed women? Um, and so, and again, I just wanted to actually point out that you do have to actually add in her name because searching the image gets you so many things because actually this has been attributed to both being Rosario Sanchez Mora, but also being the um, 13 Roses who were 13 Republican women who were assassinated. So it's been circulated for multiple reasons. Um, this is a Google Translate version, so you don't have to listen to my bad Spanish, but it turns out that um, this picture has, as they point out, been circulated as a picture of, of her um, and in fact actually showed up in a book um, by a, a, a Spanish journalist, right, that came out in 2006, Rosario Dana Matera, they tracked down the journalist, and he said, yeah, no, it's not a picture of her, it's just that the people who did the book cover felt that it embodied the spirit well, right, so that was sort of the ultimate answer. Um, of course, I wanted to check that this website was authoritative, it's maldita.es, um, it's a nonprofit, um, basically fake news, uh, Aggregator, aggregator trying to think about disinformation and public discourse. So, and it, it's works with multiple foundations. So it's pretty trustworthy. Um, you can also see even within it, they track where it came from originally, which is the EFE agency. They confirm that with the regional archive of the community of Madrid. They tell us what we know about the image itself. Um, kind of interestingly, they then even then trace that picture now that they knew where it was fun, found another picture from the same day, and there she is playing the lute with two hands, even though this was four months after she lost, that Rosera had lost her hand. So definitely not Rosera Sanchez Mora. Um, so it just sort of out of geekish assign, uh, excitement, documented all of this for the students, right? Because I had done this one-shot instruction, here's how we're, you know, here's how to use Omeka, here's the kind of stuff you're looking for. And then I was going to be able to go to their final presentation, but I wasn't going to have another chance to interact with them. But I just sent them out an email just to sort of trace all this, um, hoping that it would at least get them to be a little bit more careful about where images came from and thinking about how they circulated. Um, and we got some both expected and unexpected paths. So really kind of awesomely when I went to their final project. And again, one of the nice things, of course, about Omeka is it asked for sort of a lot of metadata they were doing a really nice job of actually tracing where things were from, right? So again, they had totally scrubbed this picture from the website, which is kind of sad to me, right? But they did, you know, for each one, this is kind of just a typical example. They were having, they were clearly saying what it was an image of, they were saying where, who the creator was, who the publisher was. So they were really sort of tracing, can we actually trust this portrait or this image, this artifact, and what do we know about it? So that was fantastic. Um, what was even more fantastic, this is the website that they created, um, is that they, and I was really struck during this moment during their presentation, this is an image that is actually in English and was one of the ones that was circulated internationally to gain sort of sentiment about the Spanish Civil War. But they talked not just about the, that context, but they talked about the fact that this image itself is saved in the Library of Congress and that it had been originally collected in the 1930s. So it was a really sort of, to me, interesting moment where they were showing awareness of why things get collected and how they get collected and why different reasons for those, right? So I thought that that was really striking. And you can actually see in other moments, they talk about the multiple points of view and what these things demonstrate. So they're really kind of starting to think about context. So that was kind of a really sort of aha moment to me to suggest that maybe we can do a little bit more with digital projects um, than I had maybe initially thought. So what I really kind of wanted to take out of this is that what are some of the things that we might kind of see as pitfalls of digital scholarship and these kind of projects can be turned into potentials, right? Um, and so, you know, that first pitfall is the one we all know, which is students grab the first thing they see on Google, 
right? Um, and I would suggest that instead, if we see this as a potential, that by using Google initially, but then tracking how an image or fact circulates, students kind of get a real life demonstration of the need for information literacy and consuming media. And I think it's this idea of the embodied experience and students actively doing this themselves that's really important to me. Um, I was an English professor for 15 years before becoming a librarian. And, you know, librarians, we get blamed for students not having good information literacy. English professors get blamed for students not having good grammar, right? And I think sort of similarly for both of us, right? We know that we can give them that lecture, be in front of a class. I could do a worksheet on commas. Students could do it fine. But then when you ask them to do it themselves in the wild, it all just kind of disappears. So what I think is kind of nice about having them do this kind of digital project is a lot of the stuff that we preach to them about media literacy, about being thoughtful about how information moves around, they get a firsthand experience of doing, right? Um, so equally, one of the pitfalls we might see is that information is presented without any sort of citations or provenance, right, as we saw with this image. Um, but I think here, again, this idea of students internalizing here, the practical need for citation, right? It not, it's not just something that they're like, oh, my teacher's gonna be mad at me if I don't do it, right? It's now becomes, they see why it was really annoying to not know where this picture was from originally and the work that they had to do to find it out and what extra information it brought along with it once they had that context. Um, and I think what that does do is it had, lets them start taking ownership over producing information as they start to see how they use it. They, are, they also start to think about how other people are gonna use it, both in terms of source reliability and in terms of meaningfulness. Um, and then sort of as a larger part of that, I think a pitfall of these sort of activities where students are creating websites and, and really dealing with the web to get, get, gather their information is you have a lot of information that's disaggregated from its original source or collection, um, which of course is true in scholarship as well, right? You don't have the entire collection from archive, you just have the parts that people picked out. But I think it's really kind of dangerous in the web, but also a thought provoker, right? Because I think students start to think about larger information production points, right? Who saved this? Why did they save it? Who's using it now in what context, right? And again, that's what really struck me in the presentation they gave and thinking about, oh, this image actually was in the American Library of Congress. Why would they have collected it? What were they thinking about? So that was kind of the sort of uh, impetus for me. And um, I've got these moments here. I'm not gonna talk about them, but I do wanna point out, like I realized I sort of have a lot of scholarly <laughs> thoughts that were behind this. I did not come up with this all on my own, um, but that I haven't really cited them a lot. So I've just got these little places where I just point out like, yeah, there's a lot of other people who have said these things much more intelligently than me um, in terms of exhibition creating as enabling information literacy on the web and the overall value of creating and curating projects. So um, I'd be happy to go back to these later, but I also just wanted to have them in there to be like, this is not me being the only voice. Um, and the other thing I do want to do at moments is I do not, I would love to talk straight for 40 minutes, but I don't think that's fun for you. So I actually kind of want to stop at a couple of moments just to sort of get feedback from you guys and sort of build this conversation. So here I'd just kind of like to ask, and please feel free to unmute or type in the chat, whatever's more comfortable. Um, other pitfalls that you've noticed in students using and creating digital projects. Um, and if you have any thoughts on how those might be transformed from pitfalls into potentials. And because I talk really fast, I do always put my questions up on the screen too. And we can definitely come back to this, but I did want to just sort of open that up for people if they had a moment as I, before I switch into sort of my next section kind of. You know, Abby, we just did an Omeka workshop at my library for a, a class and just realized how hard it is to teach in a one-shot setting anything beyond the most basic um, yeah. functions of these tools that are really designed um, for um, like library and museum professionals who already have some baseline understanding of metadata and why you need to include certain things and um, it's impossible to fit that all into the session that's like okay well here's how you actually get the thing you need up there for your assignment um, yeah. and I wonder what it would look like to kind of embed earlier on um, or work with the professor in developing the syllabus if we had that kind of relationship to, to overcome that. Yeah, and that I'm going to talk about that as sort of like the dream moment, right, because I 100% agree with you. Um, and, you know, it is actually really interesting that if you look at the literature, when people talk about doing these archival projects, whether digital or not, they tend to be these long-term projects. Um, and so I, I, I think that is absolutely the dream situation, because as you say, there's, there's a lot going on 
and some things that we maybe take for granted, right, of, as, as professionals about what we cite and how we cite and those sort of things. And that, as I said, like we maybe are seeing that they're a little bit more complicated um, than we were even realizing, but how do we sort of build that in? So I am gonna talk about like what that would look like dream situation, but also maybe how you can take some control over it by using the fact that it is a website and you do have some th places to interact in a non-synchronous way. That's a new word I just made up. All right, um, so just to sort of let you guys know, I mean, I did initially have plans, but you can see they were pretty basic, right? So when I do the one-shot instruction, um, like you're talking about there, so that like I talk about what the Dublin core is very briefly and what metadata is, but you can see like I've got these really sort of basic outcomes that I'm asking them to think about, like where do we get information from? How do we share that with others? So some consumption questions and then some production questions about like what do others need to know? Why does that matter? Um, and I do also try to really have them think about the fact that this is not just something they're doing for a class. There's very little chance that in their professional lives they're not going to be working in a digital environment in some way and assembling multiple elements from different sources so starting to think about that's really important um but those are i mean they're really very sort of lower level objectives and again i think what the students showed me through how they reacted to my sort of gentle like oh hey check out what happened here um is that we can maybe have some more highfalutin objectives so i want to talk about two possible ones um the first one is an awareness that archives are defined as very broadly defined are constructed, um, you know, and so again, I think that really looks to this idea about thinking about larger information production points who saved this and why who's using it. Um, but it also really points out to students that they really want to think about how that image or fact is circulating because it's being used for from different archives and being included in different archives again very broadly stated. Um, again, this is not me coming up with this idea at all, um, and, and there has been, I mean, a lot of work on the archives, but also particularly on curatorship as a form of research and scholarship because of that. Um, just to think about how that showed up in this example, um, you know, again, this, this example, like here, it come, becomes part of the Russian state affiliated media, right? Um, and it is really this idea that we should see uh, Ladana Vichera as an example of sort of socialism and martyrs for the cause, right? Um, again, what really struck me is that the students were really starting to think about like, well, why would the Library of Congress have collected this? Why did they have this large collection of this work from the 1930s? How were they dealing with the Spanish Civil War? Um, but I think even looking at like that authoritative source that it came from, right? This is the EFE, which is where it was finally traced to. Um, and it's actually a collection of the best images in one commercial catalog. I mean, so we can definitely think about, and I think it's good for students to think about, you know, why, um, what, what does it mean that these are still being, they're still commercial, who can pay for them and how, but also, you know, if this was selected by a newspaper back in 1936, why was that the image they selected? Why did it get circulated? So again, just thinking about these ideas about the ways archives are constructed and that one object is gonna show up in different archives for different uses. Um, so I, I connected these to the ACRL framework and then we had this great discussion in the first session about maybe some problems with the ACRL framework. So um, <laughs> take it as you will, but you know, I think it does obviously let us think about authority being construction contextual um, and searching as a strategic exploration. Um, as well as then having students start to see information creation as a process, right? So that they're not just seeing it as something that they go and find the information and drop it into the website and then it's done, but rather that they're learning as they do this and that their research is creating their own thinking about it. Um, the other, uh, maybe, slightly less perfectly set out um, objective I have here is a renewed attention to the purposes of text, right? And I think this is important. I mean, we talk about purpose all the time. We use it in the crap test. Students are pretty comfortable saying, you know, oh, this is biased, this is not. And we've had some interesting conversations about that so far today. Um, but I think one thing that really struck me in looking at these digital versions where students are encountering information is they can be a little bit tricky. Um, so again, this sort of asks them to think about production of information and why they how they might produce it, but also thinking about the practical ways in which they're going to use it. Um, to show you what I sort of mean here, here's one place that image shows up. This is the 13, here it's being uh, shown as the 13 roses. It's a blog post, and I think a lot of students would pretty quickly look at the fact that it's a blog called howlinginfinite.com and be like, mm, that's not an authoritative source. But it's a little tricky, honestly, like this almost looks like a 
table of contents, right? And it has some pretty casual language, no bull, but it's also got some kind of academic sounding language like dispute resolution and mediation. And if you look at the blog itself, right? I mean, it's very cleanly laid out. That image doesn't have a citation, which could be something to think about, but it does, it is like nicely centered. We've got, you know, headings, we've got information. And so this really is, I think, to students going to feel like a textbook and does in a lot of ways, right? And so thinking about how that information circulates may be a way for them to re-look at texts that may to them initially just feel like, oh, this is just fact and I can just grab the fact from it. Um, as just another quick example, again, this looks pretty authoritative. It's a, a series of facts. It even actually tells us where that image is from and it lets us click and follow it. So all of these things we tell students to look for. It's a .org. Um, it's not till you look at the fact that it's the Republican collective of the Basque country. And I do not know nearly enough about the Basque independence movement to speak to this, but it is obviously one that is gonna have certain reasons to talk about the Republican movement of the Spanish Civil War, right? Um, that I think, you know, this maybe moves past the kind of somewhat binary way we've talked about purpose in the past. And I think this then becomes maybe a useful way for students to engage with that. So thinking about the framework again, obviously authority being construct and contextual, um, understanding research as inquiry, that they're trying to figure out what's going on and they're learning as they go along. Um, and hopefully starting to think of themselves as part of that larger conversation. So starting to see their own voice, right? Um, and so really it's kind of, put all that together that I'm arguing maybe that tracking down an artifact, how it gets used in various texts might be a mean for students to think about its role in their own scholarship and that it becomes a part of an argument rather than just an illustration of a Wikipedia-esque fact, which might even be another possible pitfall that could be shifted to a potential of these digital projects is that sometimes they think of it as just like, I'm just getting the facts that are out there and just arranging them as if I'm creating this like authoritative source rather than thinking about themselves as being part of a bigger conversation. So um, again, to point out, I am not the only person who's thought about these things, and a lot of people have thought about the importance of these sort of public outward facing um, projects to have students thinking about themselves as producers of information as much as consumers. Um, so again, I'm just going to pause for a second to ask um, if you guys have other thoughts about these sort of what I'm calling like higher order elements of information literacy that we might be able to use this creation of di digital objects to encourage. I wrote that much better than I said it. Again, this is kind of a place where I'm trying to pick y'all's minds, so. I know, it's the after lunch pause. All right, so I do want to sort of finally end up with a practical, and you know, as, as Feta pointed out, like the ideal scenario is that this is done over a substantial period of time and that it's scaffolded. Um, I think most broadly, so that students think about and understand research as a process, right? That we are collecting data and then building an argument around it rather than finding facts to assemble. Um, I think I would love to see them moving from more basic searches, even Google to archives and specialized searches. I think that by giving them so many sources at the beginning, it kind of crippled them so that they were not thinking about why something might be useful, but just being like, oh, okay, I'm just clicking here because she told me I could. Um, and I think giving them multiple opportunities to engage with locating sources and citing them and, and sort of building on that. Um, I would say from experience, questions of what's acceptable under copyright should probably come later. I think that that can really stifle students so that they're again, really only worrying about what they can use as opposed to really thinking about what they're learning and doing from this. Um, and then really in the dream scenario, the biggest thing is that it becomes clearly integrated with course topics, discussions, and goals, as well as these library goals of increased, increased information literacy. Um, so, you know, like maybe in a dream dream world, and I actually have some, some faculty who are, who are thinking about doing this, but students might even do a small project that traces the various places an artifact shows up. Right, so um, both collections and private text. So with this example, right, they might be thinking about the ways in which the Spanish Civil, Civil War was used and continues to be used to make various ideological points and how gender might shape that. So asking them to not just be like, what information do I find, but how does that information connect back to the course um, and really to build those in. It's not a dream world. Um, of, and again, as I pointed out, like, and in general, when you look at the scholarship, when we talk about exhibits and archival projects, they tend to be these longer term projects with a lot of scaffolding. 
Um, so it's not a dream world, but I do think one awesome affordance of a digital assignment is it kind of allows the librarian to continue to interact with students as they're in the process of research. So this is from a website that students did this semester about Afro-Latina, Afro-Latinx identity, um, Afro-identity as, as the um, instructor called it. And here actually it is a, it is a source that the students are allowed to use. It does have some information, right? Um, and they even say that's from Wikimedia Commons, but they pulled it from another source. So one of the nice things about Emeka is there's a comment function that you can use. So I actually just sort of jumped in there. Um, I did not type well, <laughs> I said grat job, but um, I pointed out to them that they went back to that Wikimedia file that you actually find out who the original creator is and the date, which they didn't have yet. Um, so again, that idea of tracking information to internalize the practical need for citation, as well as what they can get from citation. Um, but what was kind of interesting is that that Wikimedia file gives you a little context that it was um, depicting Cabrilla um, and that that might be a way of thinking about Afro-Latinx identity at, as an illegal activity and what that kind of activity meant. Um, so sort of pointing out to students that they can take ownership over producing information to not just copy what others have said, but to think about its meaningfulness in terms of their own project. Um, and then finally, you know, I actually said, if you did do a reverse Google image search, you actually find this popping up in other places. And some of those actually do some really interesting theoretical work that you could use as a source So kind of forward chaining here. Um, so this really, you know, might be a way that students don't just get a demonstration of the need for information literacy and in consuming media, but maybe the values of it, that they can find more information and more useful information. Um, so again, just to repeat those higher level goals that these were connected to. Um, again, scholarly interlude, I'm not coming with, up with this on myself, um, but also um, I do think it can kind of, is this librarian overstepping, right? I mean, where's that line? And so there is some good scholarship out there about the ways in which librarians are pretty crucial as a student success tool, but also the ways that librarians and, fa library and faculty, teaching faculty can leverage each other's skills. Um, another just really quick example, Again, some images, these were, again, perfectly appropriately cited, but they didn't have any sort of context, which is kind of, I think, the next step. So I just sort of asked them, how might this be useful in thinking about this image in terms of the focus of this class, right? So asking them to take that ownership over producing information. Um, here, I even point out to them, hey, you know, this is actually a little bit blurry. So maybe if you sent them back to the original archives, they would be able to see your point better. So really thinking about that audience they end up with. Um, I do want to point out that my language here is kind of identical between the two. Um, so I think a librarian could sort of build a set of responses that they could drop into the comments to use time efficiently, because obviously this is an extra time moment. So that's sort of where I am. Um, hopeful outcomes of this session were for you a recognition of the ways in which the pitfalls of digital research, both an abundance of undocumented information and an assumption that information can be left to speak for itself can actually become a potential, making students more aware of themselves as both consumers and producers of information. And maybe within that sort of encourage backward design of fairly sophisticated information literacy competencies. So um, going beyond what I did, which were these pretty basic ones and really sort of thinking about what these projects can allow students. Um, and also hopefully gave you guys some models of how this can be done as Veto was saying after one shot and the ways in which the digital platform might become a space of continued interaction. So that's what I've got. And I would love to hear your thoughts, your questions, your places we could go with this. Thanks so much, Abby. And folks, if you feel more comfortable um, sharing your thoughts in the chat, um, please, please do that and I'd be happy to read them out. Um, and I just wanna kind of start off with a question. Um, I thought it was really clarifying um, to see the history of that image. Um, and my understanding is that you sent that um, to students after the class as a kind of like look behind the scenes. I'm curious to how they responded to that, if you were surprised with the questions they asked or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, so it was interesting. Um, so I, I sent it to them while the class was going on actually. Right. And so oh, I, I would my argument would be with very little data is that I think that's actually what got some of those better outcomes. Right. Was that thing. What was really cool is I was working with this the second one that I was showing you the um, Afro identity and there was one student who had been in the Spanish Civil War class. And so I sort of said to students like you have to be careful where information comes from. There was this one picture of a woman with a hand. She's like, oh, my gosh, yeah, that happened in our class. And like she kind of like, you know, and it was really excited about it. So I do. I think 
there was that was sort of the 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 aha moment for me, which is that I think rather than trying to stop that from happening, I think you want to let that happen, but build a space in to see what happens when that happens, if that makes sense, right? Um, you know, because it does, it seems like that really stuck with the students. And I also think it kind of, it was, I wasn't telling them, oh, you're doing it wrong or you're not citing, but I was just like, dude, this is wild, all these things that happened, right? And so I think that that kind of gave them a, a really sort of internalized reason to think about that. And I think what's cool is that happens really easily on the web, right? I don't think, I mean, this one has a great title, but I think you can see that sort of crazy circulation of images in a lot of different places. So I think you can almost expect that it's going to happen <laughs> like, and, and really grab onto that as an opportunity. I feel like that kind of concrete case study um, is so much more effective than, you know, kind of telling students information creation is a process, the right. kind of life cycle, it, that can be pretty abstract even for Yeah, them. yeah. No, and I think, I think yeah. that's, I mean, again, I think that I think you put perfectly what I took 40 minutes to say, Seto, which is I think that one of the real values of this kind of project is it allows students to do that stumble, but also to trace that stumble themselves. Um, and I think that's a lot more meaningful to them than being lectured about why they need to be careful about it. Thank you. And I've got some time for questions if folks have them or um, if you've got had similar experiences using these platforms in your instruction. Yeah, because I would love to hear people's thoughts and other ways that you've tackled this. Um, we should think about tackling this. <laughs> From uh, Kaya, thank you for this presentation. I really appreciate your positive orientation toward the way that students are interacting with information and opportunities rather than a sort of endless lament about student deficits. Yeah, thank you, Kaya. Now, I mean, you know, I think, I think what's kind of neat about doing it this way is that we're, we're all like prone to, to fall into these kind of things, right? So I think there's something kind of freeing to the instructor as well to sort of move into the space where stuff is circulating so much and it's easy to miss it. Um, you know, I feel like I was as much at a deficit as the students, right? And so that we're all kind of in that same place, so. And actually, this kind of project I initially was sort of moved into doing um, because I, in my former life as an English professor, I was at a presentation um, about having students create archives and stuff. And there was an image of a map and they were like, and this actually came from this and this. And our students realized that I was like, I've used this in my lectures multiple times and never actually looked at where it came from originally. So I think I have a lot of awareness that we all interact with information this way. Um, and it is an opportunity as you're saying, Kai. And it's a process. It's not a, you know, there's not a, a like, this is where we end up and we're all perfect now. So, Yeah, there's something about the ease with which we can find information these days that like really obscures, I think, um, that there's a lot of decisions that can be made every step along the way about um, how things are organized and made available. Um, and it's just less and less visible, I think, these days. And I think maybe making the lesson to be about that decision making as opposed to like there are good sources and bad sources. I think students want to go to this very binary, right? This is good, this is bad. It depends on what it's being used for, right? And I think, you know, that perhaps in a digital environment where they're often more comfortable, that might be something they're more willing to buy into rather than like, this is what the textbook handed me or this is what this book I found in the stack says, so it must be true. So maybe just sort of laying that architecture a little bit more bare in a way that is both useful, but I think is maybe more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate y'all coming out and <laughs> your attention, your comments and feedback. And of course, I'm delighted to talk about it at partner length if you want to, so. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. And um, I don't know, it's always really exciting to see um, how folks are approaching some of these big picture ideas, especially beyond like, here's how you use the databases, here's how you cite, but how can we actually teach these like lifelong conceptual orientations to students?